Good afternoon. This is Tara Kinney, State Policy Director at the Learning Policy Institute. I want to welcome you to this one and one quarter hour webinar on using CalEd funds to strengthen and sustain your educator workforce, jointly hosted by the Learning Policy Institute and the Association of California School Administrators. Teacher shortages are a pressing issue for the state of California. And we know from the research that the level of support provided by principals and other school leaders is a key driver of teachers' decisions to remain in or leave their school or the profession. The California Educator Development Program, or CalEd, was one of three programs funded in the 2017 state budget to address teacher recruitment and retention issues. It provides approximately $9.4 million, about $6.5 million dedicated to programs supporting school leaders, and nearly $3 million for programs focused on teacher recruitment and retention. Our webinar today will address several topics designed to support local educational agencies and their partners in developing evidence-based CalEd proposals. After a brief overview from me about the CalEd program and data sources that applicants might refer to to help make their case regarding the need for funds, we will then hear from a series of panelists sharing both a research as well as a practice-based perspective on how CalEd funds might be used. Karen DeMoss from Bank Street's Sustainable Funding Project will share research and ideas for sustainably funding teacher residency programs. We will then hear from Christina Legu from CSU Bakersfield and Brandon Ware from Bakersfield City School District about their collaboration in support of the Kern Urban Teacher Residency. My colleague Ann Podolsky from the Learning Policy Institute will share research on evidence-based strategies to support teacher and school leader recruitment and retention. We will hear from Kim McKenzie from Shasta County Office of Education and Margaret Artofer from AXA about their collaborative model to provide high quality administrator induction and mentoring. We've left 15 minutes for Q&A at the close of the webinar and we encourage you to submit your questions through the webinar as they arise. Can't promise to get to all of them, but our panelists will try to respond as best they can individually as well. Before we begin, I want to be clear that this webinar is meant to focus generally on the evidence base that LEAs, districts, county offices of education and charter schools and their partners might turn to to design and describe the programs they're proposing for CalEd funding. We aren't experts on the RFP itself, and this webinar doesn't take the place of a close reading of the RFP or of the enacting legislation. If you have specific uh, questions about the RFP, we refer you to the website of the California Commission on Teacher Credentialing, including the Q&A process for which they will be posting answers later this week, as well as the website of the California Center on Teaching Careers. We've provided links to the RFP and the website of the center on our resources page on the LPI website, where we'll also be posting a recording of this webinar in one to two days. That being said, I think it's worthwhile to identify the priorities that the 2017 budget bill language identified for CalEd funding. The legislation prioritizes for funding applicants with a demonstrated need in special education, math, science, or bilingual education, as well as those with a high number of teachers with emergency permits. Those with a demonstrated need for school leadership development, a demonstrated record of working with STEM professionals to earn a credential. The legislation also prioritizes LEAs serving high need students, students from low income families, English learners, and foster youth, and those with a demonstrated need to improve equitable access to effective teachers. LEAs in rural areas or with a geographic location that will promote an equitable distribution of grants statewide, and LEAs who are applying as part of a consortium. The CalEd legislation has five key focus areas, calling for proposals to recruit, train, and support individuals earning a credential in special ed, math, science, or bilingual education, to develop principals or other school leaders, to provide high quality new teacher and principal induction and mentoring, to engage in regional collaboration with higher education or other LEAs. Applicants can also partner with nonprofit organizations. And it uh, focuses on participating in recruitment and hiring activities with the California Center on Teaching Careers. 
An important part of any CalEd proposal will be how an applicant identifies their local need to strengthen educator recruitment and retention, for which robust local data will be key. Applicants might help make their case for funding by providing local data on, for example, teacher turnover and experience, school leader turnover and experience, the cost of recruiting and replacing educators in your LEA, the vacancies you had to fill in math, science, special ed, or bilingual education, the availability and accessibility of induction and mentoring programs for teachers and school leaders, and the percentage of teachers and leaders with preliminary versus clear credentials. The data dashboards for the Commission on Teacher Credentialing are a helpful resource for data as well. Here, LEAs can access their data on the number of emergency-style permits, and you can do that by subject, and the number of teachers who lack full certification. Again, you can do that by subject. This is a screenshot of the Commission on Teacher Credentialing's dashboards. I encourage you, if you're not already familiar with them, to explore the wealth of data they can provide. The link's on our resources page. The data dashboards may be especially useful to identify inequities in access to fully prepared and effective educators within your county or region, which CalEd funds can be used to address. You may also want to use statewide data to describe teacher shortages and inequities. Last year, LPI partnered with the California School Boards Association to survey over 200 representative California school districts about how they were experiencing teacher shortages. This survey touched on administrator shortages as well. What we found was that 75% of districts reported shortages, and of those, over 80% reported that their shortages had gotten worse since 2014. Nearly 9 in 10 reported shortages in special education, nearly 6 in 10 report shortages in math and science, and more than one-third report shortages in elementary education, which is typically an area of surplus. The survey data note differences by region as well. For example, rural districts report principal shortages more frequently than city districts. In addition to the survey data, we also analyzed statewide teacher labor force data on teacher shortages. This report's also available on our website and delves into the impact of shortages on particular student groups, including in special education and bilingual education. We found drastic growth in certifications that go to the least prepared teachers, especially in key subject areas. The number of provisional internship permits and short-term staff permits, so-called PIPs and STIPs, which are issued to individuals who have not yet demonstrated subject matter competency and may not yet have even enrolled in a teacher preparation program, have nearly quintupled between 2013 and 2016. Nearly two-thirds of new special education certifications in 2016 went to teachers who weren't fully credentialed. And in math and science, two out of every five new math and science authorizations are issued to individuals not fully prepared to teach their subject. And last year, California issued just about 700 bilingual authorizations, which is not expected to meet the growing demand for bilingual teachers following the passage of Proposition 58 last November. Finally, I want to flag a new interactive resource available on the LPI website, a teacher turnover calculator. This tool allows LEAs and their partners to estimate the cost of teacher turnover in your district using research-based estimates if you're not currently tracking this data for your LEA. If LEAs can use CalEd funds to reduce their teacher turnover, this can allow the reallocation of funds over the long term in ways that can ultimately strengthen and sustain your workforce. This leads me to the first presenter on this webinar. I would like to introduce Karen DeMoss who leads the Sustainable Funding Project at the Bank Street College of Education. Karen and her team are leaders in the field in terms of thinking about how districts can rethink their uses of funding in ways to provide high-quality teacher preparation to all candidates, and to do so in ways that are sustainable within all of the many competing pressures on district budgets. To ask questions or engage in discussion, please use the chat box in the right of your screen and click All Participants. I'll now turn the webinar over to Karen. Thank you so much, Tara. Hello, everyone, and thank you for your time today. I'm excited to be here to talk with you about what we have been finding across the country 
in terms of very creative ways that localities can figure out how to find ways to reallocate their local funds to support teacher residencies. When we began this work, what we wanted to do was figure out a way to imagine our ideal educational system. Obviously, we're a long way away from that, as those data that Tara shared demonstrate. But we imagine a place where districts have access to their diverse and promising candidates who understand the students inside their districts and who are ready to leave the classroom as soon as they come in. Aspiring teachers who can afford to go through a high quality program that gives them the length of clinical practice that they need with high quality teachers so they can learn how to do their craft. Preparation providers who really can have whole cohorts of people who really want to be teachers who come into their programs and concentrate their efforts on learning how to become teachers. Schools where the people inside schools, your already existing teachers, are leaders for their school districts, are part of the teacher preparation system, being strong mentors and building their own learning trajectory towards teacher leadership. Students and families that always have well-prepared and effective teachers leading their classrooms and communities that see their schools as the right place for everyone to go. Turns out that that vision, though it sounds really, really uh, optimistic, is not just a dream. There are possibilities to reach that vision when we have sustainable funding for quality teacher preparation. What we have found through our research is that districts who have high quality teacher preparation pipelines where their candidates do full years of residencies reduce their recurring costs associated with rapid turnover, that tool that Tara showed you at the end, um, and they also have access to the kinds of candidates they need. Aspiring teachers can afford to not work two or three jobs and to concentrate on their work and become well-qualified teachers. As they enter the classroom, they actually look more like second and third year teachers because they know what they're doing. Providers have whole groups of people who can focus on their studies and that they can recruit into programs because those programs provide them with financial support. Schools have faculty who are on a teacher con con development continuum where they are actually the teacher leaders that we want them to be so that they re-energize themselves in the profession and re-engage with being teachers. Students and families no longer have to have all of that after school and summer school um, remediation that they used to have because their teachers were not high quality. And actually our communities in the end save up to a quarter of a million dollars per student over the course of a lifetime who graduates who might not otherwise have graduated because that student has had a series of high quality teachers. When we talk about what it looks like to reach that vision, we talk about two different parts. One part of that vision is having a high quality teacher preparation system. That includes your preparation providers being sure that candidates are diverse, committed, and effective, that they ensure that candidates understand human development, content, and pedagogy, that their clinical practice offers year-long service, pre-service co-teaching in residencies that fit the models of teaching and learning and the calendars of the school districts, and that becomes important for funding, as I'll talk about through the rest of this presentation. And principle four is that districts themselves have a say in who becomes a candidate and whether or not candidates are ready. To be sustainably funded, we need the money streams to be secure so that when leadership changes, the money doesn't disappear. We need those dollars to be recurring public dollars, not dollars that you constantly have to grant uh, fundraise for. And we need it to be adequate so that our candidates aren't having to work extra jobs as most of them do. We have new data out that says that people who go into teaching make only 60 cents on the dollar compared to other people who graduate from college. Um, we know that that is problematic and that teachers now are at about a 25 year loan repayment for their educational investment in their own careers. And we know that undergraduates nationally teach, I'm sorry, work about 30 hours a week. We have 47% of our undergraduates to do and 70% of our graduate students work over 30 hours a week. So the financial adequacy of our teacher preparation programs is a really big challenge and that's a big part of what we talk about. But also our teachers who are mentor teachers and our faculty who are spending more time in school, they also need adequate resources. 
when we talk about residencies, we, and as we envision this model system, this, this ideal system for everyone, originally a lot of people were thinking that a residency program was simply a graduate program that was very um, tightly aligned to a particular a district need, and there are wonderful program models like that, uh, that worked for the year doing a co-teaching model inside a district. We've actually discovered that there are lots of different models for residency programs and lots of different ways to fund those models. So I've got here some examples. All of these cells that you see, you can move them around um, into different program models that might suit your local needs and your local partnerships. A four-year undergraduate program might actually start tutoring before and after school in year two. And those dollars might be, as we say, banked or saved so that that's that after school tutoring or substitute teaching, that work, if it's, it's actually, I don't think you guys can sub um, as undergraduates in California, some states you can, but that work, those dollars can be saved at the district level to then later on provide a subsidy, a stipend for candidates while they are in their senior years doing a residency. And coursework can be tied to that tutoring and after school and in some context, substitute teaching programs. At a, a one-year graduate program, rigorous summer training programs, including some summer pay for um, or, or, or saving of summer dollars associated with coursework before people go into a co-teaching model. In those situations, sometimes paraprofessional lines are used or professional, uh, professional development reallocation dollars because some of those programs partner very tightly with schools. So schools are able to save on some of their uh, professional development dollars and those can get reallocated. And at the graduate level, if for two years, sometimes in that first year, the candidates can work full time for schools and that work can be aligned with coursework. There's a core principle inside these models for residency programs that we talk about where all of these programs deeply meet school and district needs is building the funding pool so that candidates can actually do the year-long work. We've identified a lot of different sorts of funding pools that can feed into ways you can fund your candidate at candidates after your grant period is over. We're presenting hopefully to help you think about questions of sustainability for your project because that's going to earn you some benefit points on your applications. We have several models I'm going to share here with you. The first is around cost savings, again related to that last tool that Tara shared. If you imagine that a district hires 300 new teachers per year, and there are lots of districts that do, including lots of districts in California, 10% of those teachers resign before the second year. If your average cost for hiring those teachers is some $20,000, I believe actually it's $21,000 estimated now, then you're spending nearly 50 million, I'm sorry, $50,000, half a million dollars a year just on teachers who leave within one year. As we know, those teachers are not the strongest teachers and having them leave is problematic for our classrooms. If instead you were able to fix that, uh, that sort of sieve of people leaving the classrooms and reallocate those dollars, you could fund 48 residents at $10,000 a year. Another option is if your district happens to have what we call quick entry programs where you do a, a summer program training and then people are inside the classroom for a year, using your dollars in your Cal Ed program to fund people instead to do a year long residency and permanently replace your need for those quick entry candidates is a very wise way to then reallocate your quick entry funding towards your residency program later on. A third approach is for your districts to think about taking a portion of dollars from different funds. An average size district spends the amount of money that you can see on the left side of your screen on all of these different positions. Substitute teachers are 7% of our instructional staffing in, in education. Assistant teachers are 11% of our instructional staffing. PD is somewhere between $6,000 and $18,000 a teacher a year. And we spend a lot of money on after school programming with just small portions of reallocating those dollars uh, that size district might be able to fund 26 residents at 
And as I mentioned earlier, if you are able, you can bank dollars, save from after school tutoring or substitute teaching. This is a program we work with whose junior year candidates have a very tightly aligned curriculum from the higher ed provider. And the, the higher ed provider actually pro produce courses that align to substitute teaching in this case, which you also could do with after school tutoring. And those dollars are saved by the district so that in the senior year, the candidates are able to get a set of dollars. Um, I know my time is running out, so I'm just gonna tell you that we have some principles that we found in quality and cost-effective residency models. Um, a big principle is that you work in cohorts and that your higher ed provider deeply partners with you to be sure that those programs, those models serve your needs as districts. We've got a bunch of resources that are, I believe, already linked on the LPI website in a special Dropbox for participants today including some language that we are sharing for you that the Sustainable Funding Project wrote for a federal grant submission. All the sections that we had written that are mapped to the Cal Ed RFP are included. You're welcome to use that language. We appreciate, obviously, any kind of citations that you want to offer, um, saying that this is, these are ideas or language that you're working from, from our project. And obviously, you'll need to rework that language for your own uh, references, for your own local context. But you have some other uh, pieces here too, including I'm gonna point you to the ESSA Opportunity for Residencies. That's a document that shows how you can use ESSA dollars to support this as your programs roll on. Thank you so much, Tara. I'm gonna send the, the uh, leadership back to you. Great, thank you so much, Karen. You've really provided a vision for how CalEd funds can provide seed funding to local educational agencies who wanna create or expand teacher residency programs, especially to meet their needs for special education, math, science, and bilingual teachers. And that there are ways to sustainably fund these types of programs over time. Uh, as Karen mentioned, there's a resources page for this webinar, which includes some of the research that Karen referenced um, and also the slides from uh, this webinar. I see someone asked in the chat box if you could get those. Those are also on the resources page. I'd like now to introduce Christina Legoo, Professor and Department Chair of Teacher Education at CSU Bakersfield, and Brandon Ware, Coordinator of Curriculum at Bakersfield City School District. They are going to describe for us the current urban teacher residency, an example of regional collaboration in action. I will now turn the webinar over to Christina and Brandon. Thanks to Tara Kinney and the Learning Policy Institute for inviting us to present our current urban teacher residency program. Um, this is one model of teacher preparation that's very closely aligned with several of the focus areas from the Cal Ed RFP. Um, and we're specifically in line with the area on engaging in regional collaboration with post-secondary institutions, recruiting, training, and supporting new teachers, and also activities that result in new credentials authorizing um, instruction in math, science, and bilingual education for our program. And the, the RFP actually mentions that the Center and Commission um, is interested in receiving applications with a focus on residencies. So the current urban teacher residency is a partnership between California State University, Bakersfield, and the Bakersfield City School District. Um, we began last year, uh, and actually several years ago, with just university and district discussions related to the teacher shortage and the difficulties that the district was having with recruiting and retaining high quality teachers. Um, the district had engaged in some out of state recruitment practices that were costly and they didn't tend to result in teachers who were retained in the district beyond the first few years. So um, last year we had the opportunity to apply for some external funding through the New Generation of Education, education in, um, Initiative with the Bechtel Foundation. And we received a grant award which provided the resources to begin the partnership. Um, it also provided the structure to learn from other CSU and district partners who were engaging in this high quality clinical preparation and to create a program that is best on, uh, based on best practices and standards that we've learned from the past year from the National Center for Teacher Residencies. So there are four key components that I'd like to share with you today. Um, the first is that we provide a year-long, four-day-per-week co-teaching clinical experience for the cohort of residents um, who are earning their teaching credentials. So the district has actually created a current urban teacher resident position, and that allows the district to provide stipends directly to the residents 
for their co-teaching, and this helps to offset the resident's cost for tuition and for living expenses. Um, the second key component is that the university and the district jointly select the mentor teachers from the district and the residents. So, for example, the individuals from the Bakersfield City School District actually participate in the interviewing and selection process of the current urban teacher residents uh, once they apply to be a part of the program. The third component is that we jointly provide monthly training, calibration, and data sharing. And this really supports the premise that the residents need to receive ongoing and calibrated feedback from both the university and the district on their teaching practices. Um, the fourth component, which we have found to be very, um, I would say one of the most powerful components of the program is that our credential program methods courses are actually co-taught by the university faculty and the district instructional specialists in math and science. And so that has uh, really encouraged alignment between the university course content and the actual classroom experience. Um, one way that we have measured the impact of our work uh, as a part of grant dollars, as you all probably know, you have to show you know, outcomes and, and the results of your work. And so we look at a lot of different data sources, but I wanted to share one with you that has been very helpful for us. Um, this is exit survey data, and so it shows um, responses to three different questions here. And this is from our first cohort of current urban teacher residents, uh, which are the gray bar, and it shows their level of preparation um, compared to our credential program candidates who are in the traditional or intern program track at CSU Bakersfield and it also compares them to the state average um, from the exit survey. And it shows that the residents' perception of their preparation is much higher in science and teaching students with special learning needs and also meeting the needs of English learners. And those were three of our uh, key priority areas for the current urban teacher residency. With that, I'm gonna pass it to my colleague, Brandon Ware, who's the coordinator of curriculum for the Bakersfield City School District. Hello, all. I'd like to welcome and thank you for providing us with the opportunity to present information in regards to our work around the current urban teacher residency. Before we begin, I'd like to let you know that our vision is to become a model program for teacher preparation committed to ensuring that students in Bakersfield City School District will be provided with the highest quality education experience and become successful and productive leaders that will impact positive change. Now, what you're seeing in front of you is the Danielson Observation Protocol Tool, in which we use to gather data on our residents. The Danielson Observation Protocol Tool is an objective tool in which we use not only to provide data for our residents, but for our mentor teachers. This is our current reality. Our current reality is that under Component 2C, Managing Classroom Practices, that our residents do an outstanding job. Most of our residents can manage classroom practices, manage behaviors, and make instructional decisions in regards to those practices. If you look in the, at the other set of data, 3B, using questioning and discussion techniques, you will see that there's a 50-50 split in regards to the residents that we currently have that are able to facilitate and use discussion techniques. As Christina alluded to earlier, that we use this information in a co-presentation mode in order to present our individuals, such as our mentors, district personnel, with the current feedback of our program. This helps us work on our future implications, as well as provide a platform for conversations in regards to what do we need to do to make our program better, as well as our next step. The information that you see on your screen is also used for a one hour uninterrupted time between the mentor and the resident teacher to facilitate the learning and become a better overall teacher. What you see here is our workplace needs. As alluded to uh, in earlier slides by Karen, that there are high costs associated with teacher retention. For Bakersfield City alone, we spend roughly $69,000 on a first year teacher, and that does not guarantee us any commitment. We spend annually $25,000 on recruitment out of state and in state. And our current reality is that we're a very large district with roughly 1,600 educators, and of those 1,600 educators, 352 of those individuals are in year two or less. This also creates another obstacle for us, which means that we now have to fill positions in math, science, special ed, multiple subjects, and PE. So we decided to become proactive instead of reactive. And the way we did that was partnering with CSU Bakersfield in order to become um, the current urban teacher residency. 
the information that you see on your screen is from our cohort one. And within our cohort one, uh, Christina provided you with some outstanding information in regards to the type of co-collaborative effort we have in selecting our mentors, our residents, as well as other key components of our program. With the help of the National Center for Teacher Residency, we were able to establish our mission, our vision, our goals, as well as work to create a sustainability plan on how we are going to uh, retain these funds or find monies from different budgets in order to um, show, in order to show individuals that we are capable of using the monies that we are given in order to provide a quality teacher preparation program in conjunction with our partner. The in-kind contributions of our district for the 2016-17 school year was $153,000 plus the $120,000 from the SD Bechtel Foundation for a total of $273,500. This amount provided us with 16 residents, and as you can see on your screen, that we currently have residents who are uh, PIPs or STIPs, but those residents are not your traditional PIPs or STIPs. Due to their one year of co-teaching experience with the best of the best teachers that we have to offer, those residents are actually able to be the first day of school, understand what those components take to be an effective teacher, and then use those to apply them to their current classroom situation. The, ne the next slide shows you our in-kind contributions for the 2017-18 school year. If you look at row one, which is the 0.5 person or the coordinator of Bakersfield City School District, which is me, we have allocated half of the budget from the SB Bechtel Foundation plus the 66000 you see on your screen in order to fund my salary. This is a key component of the residency to have a person on both sides of the residency in order to, co to coordinate the daily workings of the residency program. The next uh, item you see on your screen is Saturday Lab Transportation. Our residents are working with students from Bakersfield City School District on Saturdays. We have roughly about six, 75 to 80 students who are bused in to CSU Bakersfield where they are able to experience the college experience on Saturdays. Our residents are then able to hone their pedagogy skills as well as use the information that they glean from the students in order to inform their instructional practices within the classroom. Our math and science instructional specialists are also noted there, which was alluded to earlier by Christina. And the increase of number of mentor teachers is something that we felt was something that was necessity in order to uh, facilitate the learning of the residents in a more conducive way. The funding from the Bechtel Foundation in conjunction with the cost offset of my salary with that our district felt and knew that it was beneficial to provide the mentors and the residents with compensation in order to be a competitive residency uh, within our county. So as you will see there, the resident stipend is for uh, 20 residents, which is $144,000 which is roughly $750 a month to offset living costs. And as it was alluded to earlier by Karen, that the average teacher spends 25 years repaying their loans. We try to offset that cost and show the individuals that we are invested in them as an individual, so then they would in turn invest in our district. As you will see that we roughly have 313,000, almost 314,000 of uh, in-kind contributions, but the payoff for the individuals in regards to the amount it would cost to fund or not retain uh, four teachers within BCSD um, is equivalent to the amount that we produce uh, for in-kind contributions to the residency program. And with that being said, the contact information on your screen is provided in order for you to reach out uh, with any questions or any other information that you may need in regards to establishing a residency. Thank you so much, Christina and Brandon, uh, for demonstrating what strong regional collaboration looks like and how the current urban teacher residency is helping Bakersfield to recruit and retain teachers in ways that address your local hiring context and your workforce needs, and why this is a good investment for your district. I would like to now introduce my colleague, Ann Podolsky, 
a researcher and policy analyst at the Learning Policy Institute. Anne is leading a study of administrator preparation and development in California and has been a key member of our team studying teacher shortages and evidence-based policies to address them. I will now turn the webinar over to Anne. Thanks, Tara. Uh, last year, LPI conducted a review of the research on teacher recruitment retention. Based on our review, as well as national survey data, we've identified five major factors that influence teachers' decisions about whether to enter and remain in the profession. These include teachers' preparation, schools and districts' hiring and management practices, the support new teachers receive, teachers' working conditions, including school leaders who affect teachers' working conditions, and teachers' compensation. Well-prepared teachers, meaning those who receive comprehensive preparation through coursework and field work, stay in the profession at rates two to three times as high as teachers with little to no training. I'm going to highlight three strategies you might consider to strengthen the preparation of teachers, and that could potentially be funded through the CalAD program. First, partnerships between preparation programs and local districts can facilitate the sharing of anticipated hiring needs and the hosting of strong student teaching and residency placements so that districts can identify talented candidates. Close partnerships are also important because research shows that approximately 40% of teacher candidates take jobs in the same district where they complete their student teaching. In addition, Stronger relationships between districts and preparation programs helps to connect preparation coursework with clinical training, which is a critical ingredient to high quality teacher preparation. Brandon and Christina gave us a rich description of what successful partnerships between LEAs and teacher preparation programs can look like. Teacher residencies are an example of close partnerships between districts and preparation programs. As Karen explained, urban and rural teacher residencies have been successful in recruiting talented candidates into high-need fields to work as paid apprentices to skilled expert teachers as part of their preparation. One example includes the San Francisco teacher residency, where approximately 80% of the program's participants were still teaching in the city after five years, as compared to only 38% of other new hires over that time. LPI synthesized research on residency programs nationally, which is available on the CalAD resource page we've created. The national research also generally finds higher retention rates for residency graduates than for other new teachers. Residency programs often provide induction and mentoring support following the residency year, which likely contributes to high retention as well. Residencies also recruit teachers into high-need subject areas and locations, and while most of these programs are still in their infancy, initial research points to positive impacts on student achievement. In addition, as indicated in this figure, residency programs tend to recruit individuals from more diverse backgrounds. So in short, the residency model can meet multiple areas of focus for the CalEd program from preparing new teachers in special education, math, science, and bilingual education, to providing high quality new teacher induction, to furthering regional collaboration and partnerships, all with the goal of increasing both recruitment and retention of teachers in high need subjects and locations. Districts can also create pathways into the teaching profession to recruit and train people from the community who are more likely to remain in schools in their community. These programs are sometimes referred to as grow your own teacher preparation models, and they recruit talented individuals from the community, such as paraprofessionals, bilingual teacher's aides, after school program staff, as well as high school students, and help them along the pathway into the teaching profession. For example, the Classified Staff Teacher Training Program in California recruits and trains classified employees like paraeducators. The competitive grant program provides financial assistance to participants so that they can obtain bachelor's degrees and teacher credentials. In return, successful participants commit to teach in the district for one year for each year of funding the participant receives. Note that proposals to apply for funds from this year's competitive grant program are due September 29th and could also incorporate a residency model. So after districts hire talented, well-prepared teachers, strong mentoring and support for novice teachers can, can increase their retention and improve student learning. 
These programs can be referred to as induction. The most effective induction programs include mentoring, coaching, and feedback from experienced teachers in the same subject area or grade level as a novice teacher. They also include the opportunity for novice teachers to observe expert teachers, orientation sessions for novice teachers, and reduce workloads and extra classroom assistance for novice teachers. One study of a medium-sized California school district found that after five years, the comprehensive two-year induction program brought about a 65% return on investment. And this benefit included lower attrition and therefore lower recruiting costs, as well as increased teacher effectiveness with associated increases in student achievement. Working conditions, such as the quality of the school's principal and the extent to which teachers have time to collaborate, significantly influences the quality of teachers' working environment and their career decisions. In fact, school leadership is often the top reason teachers identify for leaving or staying in a given school. Based on our analysis of representative national survey data, we found a significant relationship between administrative support and teacher turnover. If you look at the red bar on the right, you can see that when teachers feel strongly that their administration is not supportive, they are more than twice as likely to leave the school or the profession than when they feel strongly that their administration does those things well, as indicated by the smaller red bar on the left. One way to invest in principals is through professional learning opportunities. These might include on-the-job learning experiences or induction support for novice principals. Uh, the reports on this slide from RAND and LPI are great recently published resources for learning about the characteristics of high-quality principal learning. And in the LPI report, we set out to understand the building blocks of high-quality principal development programs. And to answer this question, we reviewed two decades of research that connected programs to improve school outcomes, such as student, uh, increased student learning, principal and teacher effectiveness, and retention. And from this review of effective programs, we identified four building blocks of quality professional development activities. The first building block for the most effective programs includes establishing partnerships between districts and principal professional development programs. These partnerships typically involve the coordination on curriculum, including providing authentic learning opportunities such as principal residencies where principal candidates work alongside mentor principals. Second, effective principal development programs use cohorts and networks of principals to support collegial learning. And cohorts and networks allow principals, who often report feeling isolated, to turn to other principals for support, reflection, and insight. Research demonstrates that people of all ages learn and transfer their knowledge and skills best in contexts that are similar to real-world situations. Consequently, the third element of effective principal professional development programs is that they ground principal's learning in authentic experiences that include on-the-job coaching from expert mentor principals. The fourth and final building block of effective principal professional development is that the programs focus on supporting principals and learning how to improve school-wide instruction, support collegial teaching and learning environments, and analyze and act on data. So these four building blocks work together to support the development of strong principles. So next, Margaret and Kim are going to share the elements of their high quality induction model for novice principles. Thank you all for your time today and I'll hand this back to Tara. Thank you, Anne, for providing an overview of what the research points to as effective strategies to increase teacher recruitment and retention and support the development of strong school leaders. Many of the types of programs you've described are ones that could potentially be funded using CalEd funds from teacher residencies to grow your own teacher preparation programs to high quality induction programs for new teachers and administrators. Uh, if you'd like to dig deeper into some of that research, again, it's on our website. I'd like to now introduce Kim McKenzie and Margaret Artover. Kim is the Director of Administrator Services for the Shasta County Office of Education, and Margaret is the Senior Director of Educational Services at the Association of California School Administrators. They are going to describe their collaboration to provide high quality administrator induction and mentoring in some of the most rural areas of the state. 
Again, feel free to ask questions via the chat box in the right, to the right of your screen, and I'm now going to turn the webinar over to Kim and Margaret. Thank you, Tara. This is Margaret Arthofer, and thank you, everybody, for joining us this afternoon. Um, I'd like to start by talking just briefly about the Clear Administrative Credential Program standards that were changed um, two years ago by CTC um, and share with you those uh, basic requirements that they are, of course, a two-year program and induction um, is the only pathway from now on out for administrators to earn their clear admin program. And similar to the teacher programs, it's a system assess of assessment um, and individualized professional development and goals are set. One of the things that uh, we feel very strongly about with our program is the one-on-one -on -one individualized on-site coaching that equates to about three to six hours per month of a high quality um, trained coach. So we've spent, we've been uh, working with a coaching model for approximately 16 years. And so have a system in place that has um, built and become very, very, very strong over that time. So I'll talk a little bit more about that now. So one of the things that, again, that makes our program, I think, uh, so very strong throughout California is that the qualifier coaches and the training. So I'm going to start by talking about the training, then turn it over to Kim for just a moment about the recruitment and selection. So our, our basic model is there is an initial training on a research-based coaching model, which is a, um, and have the hours marked alongside a program orientation, an ongoing training um, that all coaches participate through every um, their first year, and then 12 hours every year from there on out. They also then meet with their local program throughout the year another four times for a minimum of two hours, as much as six hours during that time. And we have a coach certification process. So the rigor of the coach training and selection um, then translates into a very, very high quality model as a portion of our program. So Kim, do you want to talk a little bit about the selection and recruitment? Sure. Um, we've been in partnership now with AXA for almost six years for our induction program. And one of the uh, highest qualities of the program is our coaching. And within that coaching process, because we serve nine counties that are very rural up in the North State, we rely, a lot of our recommendations come from our assistant principals within the counties that we serve. Uh, superintendent, excuse me. So our superintendents, uh, we have a strong relationship with them. We do a lot of um, collaborating back and forth about, uh, ed about our administrators, mainly looking at their coaching experiences and their areas of expertise. Um, and if they've had positive uh, relationships and effective leadership at their site. One of the biggest uh, hurdles we have up here in the North State is making sure that our coaches understand the culture and the setting of where their candidates are going to be placed. Many of our candidates are placed in single school school districts and play multiple roles such as um, superintendent, principal, and oftentimes teacher or special education teacher within that setting. So we work very closely with the assistant superintendents to make sure that that coaching selection uh, is a good selection and that it is a positive experience for our candidates. So I'm going to turn it back over to Margaret to talk a little bit about our professional development piece. Another piece that we worked really hard to um, reinvent um, over the last couple years was to really individualize the uh, professional development that candidates participate in. There's a requirement of 20 hours per year for each candidate, but because every single candidate is in a unique setting and then they come in with their own um, professional experiences and background that we felt it was very important for the uh, candidate and the coach together to determine what the candidate's needs are. And so they, um, they helped develop the plan. And the other part that we really focused on was the flexibility and the delivery method that the candidates could engage in. So instead of us prescribing that here are the 20 hours that all candidates need to go through, of these particular areas, it is determined case by case as to what will be most impactful for the candidate. Um, they can choose whether they want to receive that 
through a personal learning network that they can set up either online or they can do a book study or a job alike or walk through um, with, their, with their coach in order to expand their experiences. So um, both of these areas, the professional development and the um, coach training are strong components of our particular program. I'd like to talk a little bit about the structure of our program and the delivery. Um, we are a statewide organization and we serve almost every county in California in some capacity. And we um, started with kind of a, a grassroots in the Bay Area, um, the need for high quality coaching and support for um, leaders in general. Um, we found that um, through research that the job satisfaction and effectiveness of the individual um, leaders was far greater um, had they not been um, supported by a trained um, coach. And so our structure then grew throughout California as different districts and cohorts and county offices came to us uh, to um, partner. And so while you see Shasta County up in Northern California, they are actually represent their lead for nine counties with a local program coordinator that works um, together with their superintendents and assistant superintendents. Whereas other areas, for example, in Region 12, San Bernardino, we recently partnered with them in my conversations with their director of leadership development. There was um, a need to recruit and retain their new leaders. They had um, uh, and challenges once people became administrators, then moving away from the area into other districts. So part of our support there and working with San Bernardino was that they've created a, situ uh, a strategy for um, recruiting within their own ranks, upcoming individuals, and then a funding structure in which they help support by um, set aside funding for the coaches, um, coaching fees so that the burden of the coaching is not on the uh, candidate. So unlike a lot of the teacher induction programs, um, a lot of districts in California um, are, some do and some don't support their candidates with, their, with the coaching stipends. So San Bernardino made a deliberate um, choice to do that with the intention of basically the recruitment and then the retention, excuse me, the recruitment because if a neighboring county does not, excuse me, a neighboring district is not um, paying for the coaching, then you have people that come out of their uh, preliminary programs straight into a clear program and then having to pay for program and coaching fees can be um, cost prohibitive so it really was a recruitment strategy in the same for San Francisco as well as other areas. So um, we actually are up to, I think in the neighborhood of 24 local programs. Some are made up of single districts, some are made up of um, a consortium of multiple counties or districts. Um, and so we're open to a number of structures which makes it uniquely flexible uh, within, um, within our within our program. So I'm going to let Kim talk a little bit about um, specifically what happened in Shasta County that brought the program there. So in Shasta County, the uh, superintendent wanted to be more proactive in uh, kind of growing our own leaders uh, within our program. Uh, we were finding out that uh, we needed to have strong leaders, we need to be able to recruit people that would be interested in that, that superintendent principal model in many of our schools. We had a high uh, retention, we needed a high retention rate with people staying on board and, and research was showing up in our area that we had about a three to five year retention rate of uh, principals and superintendents within our area. So uh, we reached out to AXA and brought on uh, their induction program. And like I said before, we've been operating with them for about six years with uh, some fantastic results. We've probably served over 100 uh, candidates within the program and are finding that those that are in our program that um, have received the coaching, the two-year coaching model, 
uh, are staying on and are more effective in their job and seem to be when we give our surveys at the end of our programs um, are, are showing very high satisfaction rates within their jobs and their life balance. So we continue to partner with ACTS in this program, uh, providing outstanding um, administrators up in the North State. So I'm going to turn it back over to Margaret to talk a little bit about our funding and our advantages of our partnering program. So one way different districts or, or local programs have been able to fund the program is to, um, they sometimes charge districts for coaching fees, or if not, the district actually paying for the coaching fees. They've also looked at Title II funds. They've used their educator effectiveness grants, and then will be, I'm assuming, coach fees in the Cal Ed grant too. Um, part of their in-kind contribution would be that they hire sometimes a part-time director to be the local program coordinator that coordinates the selection and matching of the candidates and the coaches, as well as monitoring their progression throughout the program and delivering of resources as well as information to both. Um, sometimes the personnel um, is a coach that it's um, part of an individual's assignment so I would uh, label that as, and other duties as assigned as in so many people's um, job descriptions, that uh, oftentimes people volunteer to coach another um, individual in their area because they want to give back. And so that is actually built into their job description. In some cases, there are part-time coaches that some, some of the local programs have a person that's designated as a portion of their job where they coach up to five or six individuals. Um, if they're working full time, we limit it to one um, individual that they can coach in the induction program. And they often hire and um, recruit uh, retired administrators that have uh, additional time on their hands and they can commit to, um, to the high level of um, attention and in-person coaching. And I want to just come back to the fact that our program does emphasize that those 40 hours are in person and on the individual's site versus remote coaching or group coaching or, um, or um, having the individual find somebody um, that they may not know um, their coaching capabilities or their background or experience. So again, that is uh, one of the strategies that has helped us to um, maintain a very high quality. Some of, the, um, some of the advantages that we are hearing throughout California is that the selection and matching of coaching is, um, is paramount and that the quality of the coach um, and the coach's training and their ability to set goals and to be and focus has been, um, has been phenomenal. We've got a lot of um, feedback both quantitative and um, qualitative from our um, research that does um, indicate that. The other thing is that when we partner with local programs that we have that strong district um, partnership and support that the implementation of the program is incredibly strong um, and it is done with fidelity um, because the, the, the ability to communicate so directly with the local program, um, the district or the county offices in order to, um, to let them know what the services are and the progression of the program, as well as to gain feedback as to what's working and to make adjustments along the way. Uh, another thing that I will uh, indicate is the investment in the, fut in the future, which I believe that there were earlier uh, reports talking about that in teachers that the same is true in administrators. Um, and clearly we have gotten a lot of um, information and feedback in regards to the retention of the administrators in the district. When districts pay for the, um, for the coach training, excuse me, coach training or the coaching services and they reduce the burden on the administrator that the administrator tends to become, excuse me, the candidate tends to become um, very loyal and appreciative of the fact that that happened, especially when they're talking to their colleagues in neighboring districts where that may not happen. Also, our exit survey data um, is phenomenal. We just graduated last um, this summer 
over 340 individuals in the CLEAR admin program, and over 98% of them indicated that the coaching that they received basically helped them to set effective goals, that the coach was knowledgeable, and it helped them, and they felt that their uh, capacity as a leader grew. And that was, as I said, 98% of them responded with strongly agree or agree, um, and most all of those being strongly agree. Um, we also have just a numerous comment, like the quotes that you have in front of you. Um, and so I won't read those to you. What I'll do is turn this back to Tara to answer questions. So thank you. Thank you so much, Kim and Margaret, for providing uh, an example of how CalEd funds might be used to support high quality induction for new administrators and how critical these types of leadership development and support programs are to ensuring every school is led by a strong school leader and how critical they can be as a key recruitment tool as well. Those were great examples, Margaret. Um, I think I can hear the virtual round of applause for all six of our presenters today. Thank you to you all. And I really want to thank AXA for co-sponsoring this webinar with the Learning Policy Institute. I want to remind webinar participants that following the webinar, LPI and AXA will post the slides and the recording so that it's available as a resource to you. The slides are actually on LPI's website right now. Uh, on the resources page, and I think that link has been shared via the chat box as well. Um, the page includes a link to the RFP and the budget bill language, as well as a number of research studies that presenter, presenters have discussed on this webinar, and additional research and resources from other organizations like RAND, the National Center for Teacher Residencies, the New Teacher Center, and California State University, which hosted a very helpful webinar on this same topic last week. We have about 10 minutes for Q&A, and we've received some questions from the audience. I want to remind folks, if you want to ask a question, you can do that by typing it into the chat box on the right side of your screen. Um, and again, uh, we're not the best, the ones best suited to answer specific questions about the RFP itself. For that, we'd refer you to the website of the Commission on Teacher Credentialing and the California Center on Teaching Careers. Um, but we are happy to answer questions about the research and the programs described on this webinar today. Um, and I've been kind of monitoring the chat box a little bit with the help of a colleague here in the office with me. And um, one of the kind of repeated uh, sets of questions I've seen, has been a lot of interest in um, Brandon and Christina, your program in uh, Kern County. Um, and in particular, people were interested in hearing about a few different things. So I'm going to direct this question to you and um, to Karen to chime in uh, with your experiences on these same topics and other residency models as well. People wanted to hear more about the training that you offer to teacher mentors in the Bakersfield program. Um, and the more specifics around the stipends that you provide both to residents and the mentor teachers themselves, and then also how you um, are supporting residents and assessing them um, along the way with, with formative assessments and, and other frameworks. So I don't know if you could dig a little bit more into some details on those three topics. Hi, this is Brennan Ware, and I'll take the first question in regards to the training. So it'll kind of um, answer the follow-up question as well. Our teachers are paid like our current um, induction business support providers uh, with a stipend of $300 a month. The stipend is roughly uh, seven hours of our um, negotiated contract uh, allotted amount for professional development. With that being said, the teachers, the, the seven hour breakdown is such. They are to meet with their residents one hour a week uninterrupted to provide them with the uh, support that they need along with their continual support throughout the week. So that takes up four of the hours. The two hour monthly meeting is where we uh, conduct our training. So we use the Danielson Observation Protocol tool. From there we um, gather all the mentor teachers in the room. 
we work with them on coaching techniques because it is kind of difficult for some individuals as mentors to um, coach the resident because it necessarily doesn't mean that you're a great teacher, doesn't mean you're a great coach. So we kind of work with them on those components. And there is an extra hour or two in there just in case um, the resident or mentor teacher needs more support throughout the month. Um, so I think that kind of answers the um, training part and the compensation for the mentors. And then the compensation for the residents is the $750 a month. Um, we have recently met as a partnership to discuss for sustainability. Um, and Christina provided information with us, to us about, it takes about $15,000 um, for Bakersfield City and CSUB resident um, to have a sustainable um, income, which would cover um, <clears throat> their graduate course uh, credential uh, tuition, plus provide them roughly $750 a month living stipend. And I think that's about it. One of the things that we've seen works effectively at the graduate level is if programs are designed such that one day a week a graduate candidate serves as a substitute teacher with course supports so that that substitute teaching experience is well uh, mentored, that there's reflective practice around it, so that every five candidates that are in a graduate residency program they can make up the equivalent of one FTE salary. That's a model I think that a lot of districts are able to envision pretty quickly and something that you all might consider as you plan your grant application. And just I'll add that um, what we did with our current urban teacher residents is they did their co-teaching um, Monday through Thursday and then they were available to sub for the district on Fridays. Um, which was a large need for the district because they had a hard time finding enough substitute teachers. And all of their credential program coursework was held on Saturdays, um, which allowed us to use the uh, lab school students that uh, Brandon spoke about. And so that was a good model where the, the residents liked that their evenings were free, whereas in our traditional credential program, they usually take classes at night. I'm going to uh, throw in another question out here to the panelists. Um, do you, any of you have advice for LEAs and their partners who are developing uh, their CalEd proposals right now? The proposals are due October 27th, and um, so people do have a few weeks to, to pull them together. Do you have any words of advice um, for LEAs and their partners? And again, LEAs include school districts, county offices of education, charter schools or consortia um, as well. Um, and their partners can include institutes, uh, institutions of higher education as well as nonprofit organizations. We found this, Karen, we found two things across the country that I would share as advice. One is as you are designing these programs with your partners, do everything you can to have the program conception not be a standalone program. Have it be something that can integrate more fully into the other programming that the institution might do for uh, licensure areas that are not inside the grant. So that's the first thing. And the second thing that we have, have learned is when programs design these, concept, these kinds of efforts conceptually, does they really support the teacher development continuum from pre-service through to teacher leadership that those are stronger programs. Thank you, Karen. Any of our other panelists want to chime in there? I don't want to cut anybody off. Sarah, this is Brandon. I'd like to um, chime in on the previous question about our model. One thing that we found that was successful for our model in our district is due to the sub shortage. We actually do have the residents in their classrooms with their mentor teachers four days a week. They are able to sub on Fridays. And one thing that we also implemented was that when their mentor teacher is out, that they also are compensated um, for their um, time there when their mentor teacher is, is out. Great. Um, this is Margaret. 
I want to mention that I know that the grant does call for uh, a matching of funds or um, services. And I, I have seen in a lot of our models, a lot of districts that actually have a position, a director position, um, whether it's at the county office or the, a, dis, a district office, that it is a portion of their assignment to support the um, progression of the, the whole process of recruiting and matching and the support for the candidates um, and the coaches throughout the two-year program. And depending on the size of the program, it can be anywhere from one to two days a week. And that is um, something that they already have. Oftentimes, somebody who is in a position of uh, director for leadership development that could take that, uh, that piece on. Great. Um, thank you, panelists, and uh, thank you, everybody, for joining this webinar. Um, I know it's uh, the after lunch hour, and it's a hard time to stay focused, especially on a computer screen and, an, and a phone speaking at you. Um, so I, I really want to thank everybody for joining this webinar hosted by the Learning Policy Institute and the Association of California School Administrators on using CalEd funds to strengthen and sustain your educator workforce. Uh, we hope it has been helpful to LEAs, higher education and nonprofit partners, and other California stakeholders as you consider submitting a proposal for CalEd funds. Again, we will post the recording and slides from today's webinar on our website, as will AXA, and we will email attendees when they are available. Thank you again, and have a great rest of your Wednesday. That concludes this webinar.